So welcome to a Friday night edition of the Conversations with Kelly Show. And tonight I'm really excited because I've got Casey Everhart online. And you know, he's an amazing character from what I've been hearing and I've been able to talk with him a few times and I've just been having a blast chatting with him. But before I introduce him, I want to talk about something. And it's all about dreams. And here's the thing. Today I was watching an episode of The Dragon Den. And I don't know if you know that show, but it's basically an investor show. So what people can do is they can go and pitch their business idea to a bunch of a panel of investors, and they decide if you get to, you know, if they will invest in you or not. And the funny thing was, the person that pitched, I knew her. And she had a product that I had talked to her about probably about three or four years ago. And I just honestly did not like the product. But anyways, she did pitch the product, and she got slammed big time. She just got slammed, and she's been working on this project for about 17 years. And I told her, I said, if you're going into this project and you've done it for 17 years and still have only sold this many products, and it was less than 100 that she had sold, they're going to slam you. And she was like, no, 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 you know, I don't agree. And I was like, that's okay. But here's what my thing was. When do you give up on that dream? And that's what I was thinking about. Because I remember when I had another business of mine, and I knew I was losing the passion for it, but it was like, when do you give up? When do you stop doing that dream to pursue something else that is possibly being more productive for you, or is more your passion, or something that you love? And so I was thinking about that. When do you give up on that dream? And my answer to that, when I was not happy with my business and what was happening with it, I thought, you know what, when I don't even want to do the business anymore, and when I can't even get up in the morning to do it, and when I don't even want to take any more bookings, and when I don't even want to promote the business, that's when it's time. And it also reminded me of when my, one of my bosses said to me, Kelly, you need to make a choice. And here's the question you need to ask yourself. And this is the question. Are you excited that you have a job to come to on Monday? Or are you relieved that you don't have a job to come to on Monday? And not the same thing for a business or a dream. Are you excited that you, go you are going to have your business to come to? Or are you relieved that you don't have to? And I think when you can honestly answer that question, you will know whether you should you know, give up on that dream and move ahead and do something else or not. Now here's what happened to me. When I made that decision that I wanted to sell my business because I no longer had the passion for it anymore, all of a sudden within one month a buyer showed up and the business was sold and I was on to becoming a speaker. And then I was excited and rejuvenated and empowered and I had all this incredible energy about me because I was now doing something I was passionate about instead of doing something that was draining me. So I want to encourage you to look at your life, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a, a relationship, whether it's a job or a business or whatever it is that's in your life, ask yourself, is my whatever it is empowering me or is it draining me? And if it's draining you, then you need to make that decision whether you want to keep it or not. So Casey, I'm so excited about having you online with me tonight. You know, I think it's going to be a great way to celebrate a Friday evening. And, uh, <laughs> and I want to thank you for being willing to give up your Friday evening to be on our show. This is great. Well, you, you know, Kelly, it's, uh, it's very rare that a show comes along that I've, I've watched and I've participated in from afar and I've watched and I've watched you and I, and I, and I love the concept of the show. And, you know, I'm just I'm honored to have been asked to appear on the show. Well, that's so great because I was so excited when I saw your message. How can I get in? I want to know about this. So I was like, I'm not turning that down. Well, you know, I, I want to go. I want to. I want to start by just saying hi to everybody out there in internet internet land. We're we're excited you're here, and tonight should be a fun exchange of ideas and and bouncing back and forth and different ideas and. You know, Kelly, you said something in that in that little opening thing that I, 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 I think is worth discussing a little bit. And you know, we can we can peel band-aids off and peel the onion back and look at look at different things of, that have happened over the course of the past few years in my life that have kind of got me to where I am. 
But you know, the, you were talking about dreaming and when is it time to give up on the dream and when is it time to pull the plug, right? right. And you know, it's it's. I think I come from a very practical, results-driven background. So for me, um, I don't. I try not to operate from a business perspective too much in an emotional. In an, in an emotional sphere, I try to a actually work in a logic and scientific. I, it's sort of a, a funny thing between uh, a guy that's revenue-based, my background is all in revenue generation, um, and passion, right? One of our good friends, one of my best friends on the planet uh, is Karen Glasser. And the name of her organization is Promote Your Passion, right? And she comes from a very follow your dream, follow your passion, follow this 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 burning desire, this this yearning that you have, follow it, and that's going to lead you to riches. And while I believe that for a lot of people, that's a good roadmap to follow. I also think that there has to be a practical side, which is you have to put food on the table, you have to bring bring home the bacon to your family. And if that's not doing it, then just because you're passionate about it may not be the best reason to continue on with the business. I also have a, a, a really good friend of mine and uh, I'm sure he won't mind me using one of his quotes because he's a great friend, he's an amazing guy, his name is David Fagan and he happens to own one of the largest PR firms in the country, he's a great friend of mine and he has a great quote that I, I, uh, I share all the time and that's this, dreaming is good, doing is better. Dreaming is good but doing is better. So, you know, when it's time to pull the plug on that business, um, I look at it and say, is this, is this producing some cash flow, right? And what, do, what can we do to either increase the cash flow with no more work, or if it's not increasing the cash flow, then, um, then maybe it's time to put that aside. You know, you were talking about a friend of yours that had a product and she was going to go on. In the States here, we have a show like that. It's called Shark Tank. I know, and I know the Shark Tank. I love that show, too. And you know it's the same, uh, it's the same, uh, same, same basic concept. And you're right. It's it's funny. You know, I watch that show religiously, and it's funny because um, I've had some contact. I actually have had a client that was on that show, and I was a, I was her consultant, so I'm very familiar with that that model. And you said it yourself. If you have done something for 17 years, and you have sold under say ten thousand dollars worth of the product. You have spent probably 16,354 days too long on the project from a business perspective, right? Now, there's a difference. If you're a, a passionate about photography and you're taking pictures and, and you just haven't quite settled into where that fits for you, that's one thing. But if you are creating a product and you think that you're going to go on a show on national television and have sophisticated multi-gazillionaire investors look at your product, they don't care about the emotion behind it. They don't care that you're passionate. They don't they they are there as an investor. An investor requires a return on that investment. I know exactly and it's interesting because when I talk to her about it, I have actually pitched to the dragons. So I know what they're looking for. And when she was telling me Look, I've you know I've been working on my passion for 17 years. I said, you know what? That is actually going to be a disadvantage to you because oh, totally. they're going to say to you, "What? You wasted 17 years of your life on this? If it didn't work by now, it's not going to work." Yeah, I mean, you know, it's I, I think I think businesses. You know, you and I were chatting uh, chatting before the show about one of my businesses, and you know, um, what's really interesting is that that is a business, and I, we won't talk about what the product is. Um, but I will say this: that I had an absolute passion for it in 2006. I started. I put everything I had into that business, and a couple of years ago, the passion went away. I changed things in my life, my life was a little different, I shifted, I moved, I went through some struggles and I put that business on the shelf. I didn't sell it, I didn't get rid of it, but I let it lie dormant. Well, the cool thing about that business was in the way that it was set up, the income or the profit from that business kept, keeps happening month after month after month after month and over the course of the last three years, I haven't touched that business. And now, over the course of the last couple of weeks, I've, I've sat back and I've looked and I said, hey, 
that was a great business. The return on my energy and the return on my dollar invested into it is so high that it can't really be ignored. And so if you have a business that you're, that you're passionate about or not, and it's making money, the best thing I can tell you to do is if it's profitable, you either sell it off or figure out how you outsource it at less cost to run than what the profit is. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a pretty simple, I mean, it's a pretty simple mathematical equation at some point. Well, and, and I agree with you about the business, and, and what I had to do when I was selling my business is I had to take the emotion out of it, and I really had to evaluate it, and what was really bothering me, and the reason it took me so long to sell it, was that, or to decide to sell it, was that I didn't fulfill my dream, and my dream was so much bigger than what I had accomplished, and so I was so disappointed with myself that I didn't accomplish the dream. And that was when I said, okay, you've got to take the emotions out of this. This is not giving you what you want. It's, in fact, costing you money. It's put you 50 grand in debt, and you don't need that. And so when I took the emotions out of it, I was able to make the decision, okay, I'm going to sell it. And when I sold it, the girl who I sold it to is now making more than a six-figure income with this company. And so That's I'm so awesome. proud that she's been able to keep my dream alive, even though I wasn't able to do it the way I wanted to. But that's okay. Yeah, and you know, I think it's I think people start businesses for a lot of different reasons, and I also think that people have, um, you know, it's always really interesting as when I consult people and I work as their strategist. One of the conversations that we have quite often is this idea of what a dream is. What what do we what do we dream about, right? And you know, I'm also a guy that I don't do goals too far out in the future. Like if somebody says, "What's your five-year goal or your ten-year goal?" I start laughing because the reality is, um, maybe it's my ADD, maybe it's just the reality of of my world in technology where we change so fast and things are moving so fast and so changing at, at such a quick, quick pace. I don't like to look too far past maybe a year. I'm I'm the same scary. way. I hate it when people ask me about my five-year goal. I'll just say something crazy and just to keep them quiet. <laughs> well, it, it, it scares people because then it feels like it feels to them like you don't have a plan. You know, and people will say, you know, what's your dream? Well, to me, um, you know, my dream is also um, what drives me to create businesses and to create new projects. You know, and my, my dream is actually very simple. It's also the definition for me of success, which is the freedom of choice to go where I want, with who I want, where I want, how I want, and at any given time, and have my business continue to grow with or without me. And that's, a, right. that's an amazing dream. You know, and so, because I'm very focused, I'm very clear on that dream, and it wasn't always that way. I mean, you know, we, may, we can get into some of my big, huge failures, but um, when I look at evaluating businesses for myself, things that I'll promote, things that I'll sell from the, from the front of the room when I'm speaking at events, um, those type of things, they always now have some element of, is this project going to take me closer to that or away from that? And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. As a speaker, if I sell, uh, a, sell a book, right? I sell a book for $10 or $20 from the front of the room, that's an exchange. I give you a book, you give me $20, and we walk away happy. If I don't stand up and sell that book, it's not going to be sold, right? Right. Um, however, if, if I were to go sell and promote a, a somebody else's membership site that I sell from the front of the room a, a $20 a month membership to, you know, you know, a gym, let's just call it a gym, right? I go sell a $20 membership to a gym, and that gym is going to pay me $5 every month for every member that I bring there in perpetuity. Well, now I'm creating a residual based income, right? And people hear the word residual, and they get all freaked out, right? Um, there's affiliate models, right, where, where I, we can go take somebody who has a product, and we can sell it on their behalf and take a little slice out of the center. We have um, network marketing, home-based businesses, where you can go out and you bring a customer to the table, 
and you get paid to bring that customer to the table month in and month out over and over and over again right we have um, we have investments where you can invest in a stock or a bond or some type of an investment vehicle that gives you interest right so for me everything I do is always trying to evaluate the the um, the ability for it to return money into my pocket over and over right I'll give you one more example if you go and you buy a rental house or an investment property um, and you make positive cash flow of a hundred dollars a month well how many of those can you possibly invest in the answer is as many as I can get my hands on right right um, that's another great way income stream cash flow residual income um, however if you go and invest in a property and your cash flow is going to be minus ten cents per month and you're gonna lose one dollar and twenty cents of a year how many of those investments can you afford to do eventually you're gonna run out of money so when I evaluate businesses and, and opportunities and projects I'm always looking for those projects that are going to provide me a stream of income in perpetuity if possible it's not always that way but that's that's now my model having come from um, having come from uh, a space where that wasn't always the case right okay so now I have to get into the pain because it's all yeah. about the pain for me <laughs> and you know I always talk about on my show how a lot of people think that when they meet somebody like Oprah Winfrey or somebody who they believe is very successful a lot of times they think that that person started at the top and they they forget that people have to take step by step by step to get where they need to go and a lot of times you know you and I have talked about this where we have some failures along the way you know people say you know you have it so easy look at where you are and look at what you're doing and you're going to Africa and you're doing this and you're doing that you know you you have it easy but what they didn't see is probably the hundred failures that I had before that so I want to know about one of your failures I want you to tell us about that how maybe it was a failure at the time but you know it wasn't a failure in the end yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk about a business failure that, that there's just really no way for me to come off and tell you that it was a success in, in, in any way, shape, or form. So it was a failure from the get-go, and it didn't stop being a failure. Um, I come from the film business and the entertainment world, and um, I had built a very successful rental company where we rented film, film and television equipment to studios and film production, so on and so forth. And I had a business partner at the time, my best friend. And to this day, he's still my best friend. We today we we um, we are seeking to find another project that we could work on together because we had such a great experience with this. Well, we ended up selling that company for seven figures. We were very very excited. We had made a just a ton of money at a really really young age, and we were you know we were in our um, oh gosh we were in our mid twenties. So it was a it was a raw. I mean. You don't give a kid, well, look at Justin Bieber right now, right? You don't give kids that aren't that mature that kind of money, right? <laughs> uh, it causes problems. Um, if it's, if Are it's you not speaking from experience, cancer. Casey? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and so we took that money and we decided that we were smarter than the system. We were smarter than everybody else. We had outsmarted the business world and we had decided that we were going to go look for another business that we could do the same thing with and we really started to evaluate businesses we brought in all these brokers and we brought in all these advisors and attorneys and all these people gathered them around and said okay here's what we are looking for and we gave them this list and we started off with about four thousand businesses around the country that were for sale that that we that met our initial criteria and we whittled that down and we whittled that down and we whittled that down and looking back, I can say this because it was, it's probably one of the most embarrassing business decisions I've ever made. But when we sat down, we each made a list of our like must haves in the business, right? And for me, because in our old business, it was always hot in there because it was a warehouse and we didn't have an office. And so we were out in a big warehouse where it was hot when it was hot here in Los Angeles and cold when it was cold. My only criteria was I wanted an office. 
and I wanted an <laughs> office that had a door, and I wanted an office that had a heater and an air conditioner. <laughs> right? And that was literally one of my um, requirements. Criteria. It was it, it, it was it was a it was a deal breaker, and I can remember looking back and and we had gone and visited a, a hair salon that in retrospect was the perfect business for us, but it didn't have an office, so I scratched it. <laughs> and instead, um, we pulled the trigger on a deal to buy uh, to buy a clothing manufacturing business. So we made 4,000 pair of women's pants a day. We had 120 employees. Uh, we were what was called a split shop, which meant that um, we had two different cultures. Most manufacturing facilities in the clothing business are, there's usually one culture that runs it. It's either um, primarily a Vietnamese sh shop or Honduran, uh, uh, you know, a, a Mexican, Mexican shop, Armenian shop, Chinese shop, yeah. Vietnamese, so on and so forth. Well, we were a split shop. And that split shop meant that we had two cultures in there. We So we had half our staff was Armenian and half our staff was Hispanic. Now, for those of you that are watching, let me give you a little bit of a, a, a cultural lesson here. Traditionally, Armenian groups and Hispanic groups don't play well together for they whatever reason. They don't play reason. good together? <laughs> they don't play good together. They don't share well? They don't share and play well together. Now, in that environment, you got a couple of white dudes rolling in to own a clothing manufacturing business with two different cultures that don't particularly get along in the first place. And you probably don't know either one of those cultures. Um... I knew I knew uh, a little bit of Spanish because in college my partner my business partner and I had a radio show that we did all in Spanish. So in that case and and here's the funny thing we actually bought it from uh, an Armenian guy. So the Armenian crew had the political clout when the old owner came in, but when we came in they found out that we had done a Spanish speaking show. So then the political thing shifted over here. Now, I say this for a reason, is that we did no research on this whatsoever. We didn't interview employees. We, did, we went in thinking that we had just hit the jackpot. But the reality was is that we just, with the signing of a signature, became responsible for 120 families and making sure that they had clothes on their kids um, to go to school, making sure that they had enough um, groceries to, to, to have on their table. We had to deal with people um, that were probably not um, U.S. citizens. And I say probably meaning they weren't. Um, <laughs> we, had, we had cultural issues. Um, you know, there are different holidays. Um, we had to deal with different, um, different currencies. And at the oh, end of the day... Lunchroom issues. You probably had lunchroom issues with the smelly foods, too. Um, well, we had two lunchrooms. <laughs> <laughs> on either side, we had two sets of bathrooms. Everything was done. Everything was done in, in in twos, and we thought we could come in there and just make it a happy little rainbow. I mean, I remember one of the first things I did was I made everybody step outside the workshop, and uh, we alternated sewing machines, and it went Hispanic Armenian, Hispanic Armenian, Hispanic Armenian. And that was going to be my way of blending everybody together. That lasted about an hour and a half. What? Um, the other thing that we didn't realize was that the clothing manufacturing business was far more complicated than we had ever thought. But I had an office with air conditioning and a heater. So you were um, happy. I was, really well, I was, I was, you know, so here's the deal. Uh, it was a great, the only success I could come out of it was, uh, I guess that I could probably write a book. That would um, that would be called how to lose a hundred thousand dollars a month with hardly even trying, and then you open it up and it just said buy a sweatshop. <laughs> right? We did not go from rags to riches. We went from riches to rags. And um, in how long? Um, we had that business for just under a year. We had burned through a million dollars in 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 capital. Uh, we literally had to almost just literally walk away from the business with um, pretty much dead broke, both of us. 
And and for somebody that had come off of being very successful in a previous endeavor, it was a massive collapse. And you know, when you talk about pain, Kelly, and I don't normally talk about this, so it's 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 kind of cool to be able to say this, but um, as an entrepreneur, when we had that sweatshop, I don't call it a sweatshop, sorry, perspiration salon. Um, <laughs> oh, you got your salon. Why didn't you just bring it here? Yeah, hair we got the salon. Hairdressing <laughs> salon. You know, I think what was really interesting is is through our endeavors, we were true entrepreneurs. We had the spirit, we had the bug, we we had the world by its feet. At one point, the two of us were operating 17 different businesses. We had a vending machine business, we had a t-shirt screen printing business, we had a printing business, we had a graphic arts business. So we had all these, we had our fingers in all these different things. And we were building up, we used to joke that it was the steamroller, right? And we were building the steamroller and it was going up and up and up and we knew that as soon as we crested the top of the steamroller, it was done. I mean, it just goes downhill and we were gazillionaires. And that experience, that one year, um, took the fire that was burning inside of me to create, um, build, um, just go out and take over was extinguished almost immediately. The flame inside, the, the burning, the burning, you know, um, a good friend of mine, Michael Levine, says people have to have a burning maniacal rage inside them to be successful. It took that and it squashed it. It, and really, it really broke the entrepreneurial spirit. I bet, yeah. you, and I'm going to be brutally honest, do you probably feel, felt stupid? I don't know if I, don't know if I felt, I, where I felt stupid was in not evaluating the business in the first place on the fundamentals of business, but on some pipe dream with no real homework. I mean, that is just, that is, that was biting off way more than we should have ever done. So it wasn't stupid like I felt stupid, but it certainly crushed my um, crushed my entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, it really like squashed it. I wasn't able to network. I wasn't able to talk to people. I mean, I literally can remember calling my mom with in my in the downstairs of my house with all the blinds closed, you know, tears are pouring down my face, and I just said, I'm a total failure. I'm I, I I should just go get a job. And my mom said something that, you know, and she she will probably never see this, but um she said something that to me that that I will never be able to repay her for. And she just said, Oh, and oh, and I forgot one element of this. I had borrowed a crap load of money from friends and family. I had multiple investors who I owed multiple six figures to. Yeah, but you I had millions of dollars. So how come you also had to Because we more were losing a hundred thousand dollars a month. So I was refining my house to pay payroll. I was borrowing in huge chunks to pay to to pay off sewing machines. It was it. We were a mess. We were a giant grade A mess. And I remember um, calling my mom, and my mom was my mom and dad were one of our investors, and I just said, I'm I don't even know the thought uh, that I'm going to have to call these people. And tell them that I just lost their money, like literally makes me sick to my stomach. And my mom said something to me that 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 I will never be able to repay her for. She said, "Casey, are you healthy?" And I said, "Mentally, no. Physically, yes." She said, "I'm asking physically." And I said, "Yes." And she said, "It's only money." And I, and it was a, it was only in that moment that I felt a little bit of. Um, a little bit of calmness because I figured I could probably rebuild, but that was such a huge chunk to lose in only one short year that it w it just, I mean, I don't know what else to say other than it just broke the spirit. The spirit was more important than the money, right? And, and, and you know, I can relate to that because about 15 years ago, my when I was married, my husband and I, we had built a business from home basically from concept to completion and we ended up doing it from home and then we saw, we uh, expanded it into a storefront and then sold it and we, we suffered a lot of money and we were broke like within six months later mm -hmm. and it was like what just happened and we had like nothing to show for it like we didn't take that money and go buy a house 
we, you know, was like, and then there, the guilt that came with that, because it was like, how come we were so stupid to not put the money in the right places? And, well, you know, and it you, just... You know, it's a, it's, it's a tough thing because there's no real, for entrepreneurs, right, or business people, you can't be told anything because you're following some guide, right? You're following some spirit, some 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 book somewhere. If you don't, if you're a crackpot dreamer like all of us are, and you go out and you start building this business, there's no real real roadmap to say, okay, I made this much money, X amount should go into a bank. And there's just there's not. I mean, you have advisors, and you can bring on, and you can kind of develop that. But, but when you're laser focused on putting a business together, my guess is that you and your husband, um, the thought of a house probably was so outside of your scope because you were focused on what's the next thing I can do to make this business be successful. Well, and we were we were in our twenties at that time, so and we're all we're dumb in our twenties. Yeah, and you know, and we were on. To, we are, and we were on to doing our next best thing that we thought was going to be incredible. And you know, and the investment part didn't come through, and you know, and we we're scrambling around and whatever. Then we decided to go get jobs, and you know, and really, if that's the worst that happens, is that you have to go get a job. Is that really that bad? Well, I mean, you know, that's, for, for I mean, some people it is, but for some people it isn't. At least then we were, at least we were still capable of working. Whereas some people, you know, they have accidents and stuff, and they're not capable of working. But yeah, you know, it's um, it's it's uh, it's it's just a very, it's a, it, we entrepreneurs and business people. I mean, we're a little messed up in the head, right? On some level, um, you know, I think the hardest part of me for that entire experience was having to walk into that office one day and know that the level of responsibility that I had on my shoulders, which was feeding 120 people, I was going to have to walk away from that. And those employees um, and their families, even though we sold the business, I knew that the guy buying the business wasn't going to last very long. It, it was, I mean, I still think about that today. And so when I look at projects and evaluate projects, for me now, it's a lesson learned. I have to also evaluate the human element of it. You know, does this have the capability of 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 hurting somebody if the thing goes wrong? Right? Okay, so when you were feeling so, you know, down and out and feeling like a failure, how did you shift out of that and start, you know, where did you get your energy from to do your next business? and be successful because a lot of times too if you keep getting beat up and beat up and beat up about being a failure it's really hard to shift out of that and then think that you have the belief in yourself that you can be successful it's, so I, what, I, what did I, it take for you I mean I, I, I would say that you know that was probably seven or eight years ago and I would say it's probably still not back to where it was prior to that um, you know, I think it, it was my grandfather. My grandfather was a huge inspiration to me. Uh, both my grandfathers were a huge inspiration for me. Um, and I can kind of morph them into one person um, in that they were both entrepreneurs in the sense that they always believed in spreading the risk around, right? So they all, the, both of them um, had multiple layers of income. And what I realized, the, the thing that kind of helped shift me uh, shift me at that moment was sitting down and saying, okay, what would grandpa do? What would my grandfather do? And when I looked at those, you know, one of my grandfathers was in, uh, in Colorado, and I can remember him saying to me, oh gosh, I'm, I'm bringing back memories, but they're both not with us anymore. So um, one of my grandfathers would always say, you know, you got to keep a stiff upper lip, right? And, and so it was really about sitting down and saying, okay, um, I need help. So, I mean, the most embarrassing thing is after that, I had to go to my folks and say, hey, I'm literally going to be on the street without your guidance. And and to my parents' credit, they did what they did and um, helped me survive a, a few months. Um, you know, and I, I will always owe them for that. Um, and then it was really to sit down and say, okay, where was the biggest mistake? The biggest mistake in that was 
stepping away from the idea of multiple streams of income, right? We had all these businesses and we had kind of got rid of all those to focus everything on the perspiration saddle on. Um, <laughs> and, and so I really, I really had to take a step back and say, okay, what would grandpa do, right? And so what I felt my grandpa would do would be to say, okay, you can be pissed off, you can be sad, you can be angry, you can be hurt for like the next hour, go ball your eyes out, and then at some point you got to start putting yourself back together. And what does that mean? And so what it, what it really meant for me was um, getting clear on what I wanted, right? Um, what it meant was getting clear on that I want to uh, not miss my um, nephew's hockey game, not miss my, my nephew's, you know, I have one nephew that's an amazing wrestler and another one that's an amazing uh, hockey player. And I'm missing those games. I'm missing those matches. And so I don't want to I don't want to be in a position where I can't go visit them and I can't go see them at will. And so now, um, and well, since that point, what I did was I had to kind of say, what's the path for me? And that path for me turned out to be I, I hate the word focus and I, I detest and despise the word balance. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, I had to figure out that I will not put all of my energy into only one thing. I do, I'm not a focuser. I have ADD. I'm an entrepreneur. The, the idea of focusing on something for longer than 20 minutes is outside <laughs> of my scope. It's just outside of my scope. Oh, I'm with you. I just um, haven't been diagnosed with it. I'm just going <laughs> to. Yeah. Um, and so I just said, look, I have to, I would rather, um, rather than making $100,000 a month from one income stream, I would rather make 10 $10,000 checks or even better yet, a hundred $1,000 checks. That way if one goes bad or one doesn't and you can always try and balance and thing and that's really where I started to focus on, okay, what's going to provide me a check with not as much effort? What can I invest my money in, invest my energy in that's going to have a, a longer term, higher residual impact? Um, and let me build those up to between five hundred and a thousand dollars a month. Try something else. Five hundred thousand dollars a month. Try something else. Five hundred thousand dollars a month. Try something else. And by doing that, I spread my risk. I spread my energy. And people will say, "Oh, but it's focus. It's about balance, right? You got to balance your work life and your home life." F that, right? And um, let me tell you why I hate the word balance. This is this is important. This is what I learned is you know the other reason that we bought that 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 clothing business was we wanted balance. In the film business, they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we we're getting calls at night, we we're getting calls on the weekend, early close. It's not a traditional business. In the clothing business, it's time for dollars. So you have from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. to get as much done as possible. So we felt it was creating balance in our life balance between our work life and our home life. We each had families at the time and, um, and so I had a, a, an amazing conversation with one of my business coaches, um, Patricia McDade. I, I owe so much to, that, to, to her and her staff and my personal coach is a good friend of mine, Yvonne Teruya, and we once had this conversation about the word balance. And what I hate about the word balance is that it's an either or conversation. You're either at home or you're at work. To me, how do you follow your passion and then turn it off, right? Um, you know, and, and you know, Warren Buffett says, says a quote that I just love, which is, what you love to do should be your hobby. What the world loves to do should be your business. And when I started thinking about that, it, it's, it's a, for me, the word that, that I like to use is workability. Workability means how can I be in business 24 hours, seven days a week, and work that into my family and all the other things, my fun, so on and so forth. So like my mom always gets on me. She'll like, she'll say, what do you do for fun? And I say, um, I don't know, read a business journal or watch a webinar or some new software program. <laughs> I know. I've often thought about that too. What do I do for fun? You know, people are asking me, what do you do for fun? Oh, and to me, that's okay. fun. I don't know, writing my next <laughs> Tuesday night call, prepping, pr running PayPal invoices. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, for me, that's, that's fun. It's working 
I work hard and I play hard. Now, that doesn't mean I don't go to the beach. I mean, I do live in Los Angeles. But, um, you know, I think just going back to the pain thing for a second, I think it was um, at my lowest point where, where I really um, looked around at the people that I looked up to, my mom, my dad, my brother, my brother, uh, my brother has had some uh, some in far worse um, and bigger challenges than I can ever dream of going through, and he's got an amazing wife, two amazing nephews. He runs a company. He makes prosthetic legs um, and braces, and has a company that's just rocking and rolling. I look at my grandfathers. Both of them were unbelievable um, people, men, fathers, mentors. And my and both of my grandmothers were just unbelievable people, and I sort of looked around, and then I looked at I, I looked at um, you know, my friends, and I said, who is it that I want to emulate? Who is it that if I could pick who I was going to listen to, that I would listen to? And I started looking, and I go, okay, well, what can I pick from each of those folks to kind of put this overall package together? And so it's, you know, I I uh, I really look. At that dark, deep moment, I really had to take a step back and go, you know what? I'm not nearly as smart as I think I am. I'm smart, but I have to really take a look, and I got to I got to pull a piece from my mom. I got to pull a piece from my dad. I got to pull a piece from my brother. I got to pull a piece from my two nephews. Right? I mean, my my inheritance is going to go to those two boys. So for me. I want to give them the best experience of me being an uncle as possible. And and that's really what happened when I got to be where I thought I was stupid. At the same time, looking back, you know, and I think a lot of us will do this, looking back, um, it was probably, in retrospect, still hard for me to say this, Probably one of the best things that ever happened. Although I would really have liked that money back and not have have made that huge a mistake, <laughs> you know. But um, I think that's made me a better person. And watching how um, my family, we all had to kind of rally around that at the at the time. It hasn't always been easy with the family, but. Um, you know that that's really what you, I, I kind of had to take a step back and put a different business. I, I guess what I'm saying is I had to look at a different business model, right? And my business model came from spreading it. I don't get I don't get I, you know I'm not a head down focus guy. To me that's just not my gig. Karen Glasser, that woman can put her mind to something and put her head in a computer and just does not. And, and it is it is it is so out of my scope how she does what she does. But that's playing to her strength. For me, I'm a starter. I'm not a finisher, right? And that's the, that's the way I am too. I'm totally a starter. Totally a starter. And and the funny thing is, when I was married, my husband was the finisher. So even when we started our my business, I would get all the funding. I would get the business plan. I'd get the marketing plan. I'd get the website done. I'd get the the sales rolling, and then he would finish it. You know, and there'd be many times when, you know, even for example, we were decorating our kids' cupcakes for their first birthday, and I came in and got everything started, and my mom was watching this because she knew that I'm a starter, he's a finisher. So I get it all started, and I get half of them done. I walk away. He comes into the kitchen and he finishes the last twenty, and my mom's laughing because she's like, "Oh my gosh, I just saw you guys do that. You start, he finishes." <laughs> and sometimes that can be good, and, and other times that can be challenging because there's times for me it can be very challenging to finish, which is part of my destruction because if I've lost interest, then it's like pulling teeth to try and finish it. Well, but here's what, here's what I would say because I've heard that from coaches and counselors and therapists and, and everybody else, and, and here's, my, here's my response. I feel like I'm giving the response to the State of the Union, right? That's when our president gives some sort of speech and tells everybody how the country's doing. For those of you that are in Canada and other places, um, I'm in Canada. I remember that. I know. That's why I'm. That's why I'm explaining. Like you're talking Dragon Den. I'm like, wait, what? That's a Shark Tank. Um, <laughs> I should have mentioned Shark Tank because two of the dragons are on Shark Tank. Oh, there you go. You know, I I think the deal is. Um, I don't think that we. I think as entrepreneurs, we put an undue level of pressure on ourselves. If you know you're not a finisher, 
I don't think it's okay for you to beat yourself up for not being a finisher. Where you should beat yourself up is in not putting a plan of action in place to take over when you lose interest. But to but 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 knowing of that of yourself, that's that's the great gift. I I I don't finish things, and I hate details, despise it. Karen, I get, you know I'll go back and use Karen as an example she, because she's one of my closest friends. And I love I Karen; she's amazing. I literally call her Mama Minutia, because I will say something like, "Oh my gosh, I just got booked to speak at a three-day event in Tampa." And she'll be like, okay, what hotels, what days, what are your airline are you flying, when are you going, how many products are being there? And I'm just like, what? can't you just be excited that I just said I got booked at a sales day? <laughs> Why don't you do the details and I'll just look after but the that's, But <laughs> that's her gift. That's her genius, right? Yeah. And I think that's, that's – I think when you're in a dark place, it's you have to be realistic about what your genius is and outsource everything else. And, yeah. and 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 I you know it's it's I I am not a content creator. I love doing videos. I love doing speaking presentations. But if you tell me to sit down and write an article, I have a freak out. I have in front of me. You guys can't see it, but in front of me, I have an entire wall that is a um, eight foot by eight foot white uh, dry erase board. And every week I do a, a sales and marketing call, and I write out the whole call all over the board. You know, people come in here and they're like, oh, my gosh, I look like I'm looking at Sheldon Cooper's chalkboard, right? Because I have formulas and all kinds of stuff on there. I am so okay with that because I can crank it and I know what I'm talking about. I just got to get my thoughts on paper. Translating that to the written word, I'm out. I don't, yeah, I take just, speak it. Like, just speak it and then get somebody to transcribe it. That's all you got to do. Yeah, but now I gotta find, find a transcriber. Some... I gotta do. No, 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 no. You go to Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com, and you can get somebody to transcribe that for ten dollars for you. Yeah. Well, so, five dollars. I'll do it for five, but transcribing depends on how much you do, how big it has to be. But that would be finishing. That would be finishing. Which and would be not, good. That's not my genius. No, but here's the thing. You then call you're Karen not Glasser. Having, no, <laughs> then you don't have an anxiety attack because you can't finish it. You just I can't just call Karen. <laughs> All you have to do is speak it. That's it. And then you just give your person the file and they type it up for you and you look like a magician. <laughs> yeah. I I do have <laughs> I do have people that will will transcribe it, but um you know, but but that's the the interesting thing, just going back to your, your question of kind of what that destructive thing is, you know, I think there's also a level of confidence. When you have, when you get on top of the world and you get knocked down, um, you know, I call it the entrepreneurial spirit, but really it's confidence, right? You know, in high school I was a skinny, scrawny kid. I, 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 was, um, I was fairly popular, but I was only popular because I was a politician. And the way I, the reason I say that is I could figure out how to get along with everybody because the last thing I wanted to do is get my ass kicked. <laughs> <laughs> I figured out real quick that you better become friends with the football players if you're going to be the captain of the debate team because there's a high likelihood there's going to be an ass whooping over here unless you get the football guys to like you. You know, luckily for me, this is the one time where my mom working in the school system worked to my advantage. The football players all really loved my mom. So I was protected just because they liked my mom, not because of anything <laughs> anything I did. But um, it's really funny. You know, I, I got to say, Kelly, I very, very, very rarely do I talk this much about, about family and, um, and things. And it's, it's, uh, it's so important. And, and, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're listening, I also don't necessarily think just because you're related to somebody by blood that they have to be your family. Oh, right. I'm a total huge believer in that, and I don't. I don't, I believe that too. Just because someone's your blood, doesn't mean that they have to be your family. Exactly, and people that are, you know, I I, I have a conversations with a, a, a lot of um, a lot of my girlfriends uh, about their husbands and their boyfriends and, and and their relationships. And one of the things that, you know, they don't always like to hear this, but for me, my sort of philosophy is this that. I think it is very unrealistic and on some level setting a situation up for failure 
to think or believe that any one person can fulfill all of your needs all of the time. Hey, I'm with you on that. And I tell you, like the next relationship I'm in, you know, um, I have a lot of guy friends and they're very close to me. And it was really quite interesting because in the past two weeks, two of my very close guy friends who are quite a bit older than me, right? Like they're, you know, in their late 50s, early 60s. And they're both said, by the way, the next man you married is going to have to pass my test. <laughs> before he, and, and the thing is, whoever it is that I'm involved with is going to have to accept these men are in my life because they are so close to me and they know me so well and they're mentors of mine and, you know, it has to be that way. Well, you know, I think it's, you know, I was just in Las Vegas this past weekend and I was, I was um, hanging out with a, a, a good friend of mine and he has a new girlfriend and his, uh, one of his old friends is a really close friend of his and the new girlfriend um, doesn't like him hanging out with the old friend. And so we were talking about it and I said, you know, I said, here's the difference. I think for me, I've gotten to a point in my career, in my life, where as I get involved with somebody, I just want to know the baggage that comes with the package, right? I want to know, I just want to know, and I have to either evaluate, am I okay with that or not? So when you're evaluating partners, boyfriends, girlfriends, lovers, non-lovers, friends, advisors, coaches, everybody in your life, you kind of got to go, okay, I know what I'm getting into bed with, so to speak. You know, if, if you, if you um, start dating somebody in the military, for example, I use two examples. If you date somebody in the military, you have to go into the situation accepting the fact that there is a possibility that they're going to be called to the front line of the duty and they could actually give up their life um, in exchange for being a part of the military. Same with if, you, if you're dating a police officer or a fireman or a firewoman or, 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 or whatever that is, you kind of got to know. You know, in my, rela in my relationships, um, I, know, I, I know going in what I'm getting, getting in bed with, so to speak, and I never lose sight of that, right? I happen to, uh, I happen to be uh, in a long-term relationship with with somebody that is is very often out on the road on uh, tours with musicians. It's ridiculous of me to to de to decide that all of a sudden I want somebody at home when I get home and they're going to cook me dinner and they're going to do the laundry. And that's just uh, that is ridiculous. In the same sense, and and you probably can relate to this. I'm a speaker. I'm out on the road. I'm traveling. It is. It is six o'clock on a Friday night here in Los Angeles. Um, I am supposed to go to two different parties tonight. I'm going to have to join up because this, for me, is what I committed to, and this is where I want to be right now, and this is part of my career. And so it, you know, it's it's you have to kind of just know what you're what you're you're dealing with, accept it, and um and and embrace that and understand that not any one person can provide everything to you at once. You know, I know I keep using Karen as an example, but Karen is one of my closest friends on the planet. Um, I don't go to Karen to talk about um, dreams and visions and all of this stuff without knowing that at some point she's going to reel me in and go, okay, I need the details. I need the, I need the, I need, I need this in order for me to process, I need contracts. I need this. I want to know what are you selling? What is the presentation? How many slides are you? How many minutes? So I just know that, okay, I'm going to tell, share with Karen a new business idea, a new venture. She's going to go, great, now, comma, space, and then there's going to be a list of details. Right? right? Where, where I can get on the phone with you and behind closed doors, we can chat about, and I can be talking about greeting cards and residual income and all this and that, and, and I don't get too focused on the details, right? We're both speakers. We're both peers in that word. We can talk about stages. We can talk about promoters. We can talk about all that stuff. We, right before this, we were talking about you know schools and bringing, bringing you into a school and how you can maximize your, your return in the school, right? So it's, it's I think, just – I think the other thing for me – is really about understanding that in a deep dark place 
you gotta you gotta look to the right people to get your needs met at that time for what you need rather than trying to go for calling your ex up and deciding that you're going to unload all of this baggage on your ex in which your ex is not going to give you the response that you want because they didn't give you the response you wanted in the first place which is why they were an ex in the first place <laughs> right i mean it's it's you know we I, i'm 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 very familiar with 12 step program i i don't know how popular they are up in canada but you know, I've been a member of Al-Anon for a long time, which is Friends and Families of Alcoholics, and it changed my life for the way, way better. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about in there a lot is, you know, it's not really fair um, for, uh, oh, no, I'm going to totally mess the phrase up, but you can't drink poison and her hope that it hurts somebody else. Right? And, and yeah, yeah, exactly. And I come from, you know, a whole family of alcoholics, too, so I totally understand all that. And, you know, one of the things I also understand is, you know, when I have a business situation, I can't go to my friends who, you know, are employees that don't understand business and don't understand that dream. They need that job. They need to know that they're going to have a paycheck every two weeks. You know, they, they, don't, they don't relate to people like me who have this big dream and this big vision and don't know where the next paycheck is going to come, but you know it's going to come from somewhere because that's just how it is, right, when you have those visions and stuff so you know um, and it's interesting because I can't go to my business friends with my deep dark personal stuff right so it's totally like what you say is we have to have a circle of friends who are going to support us in all different ways and even like my friend I was having lunch with today he's the one that just told me today that you know whoever I marry has to pass his test and I remember one time I was feeling really sorry for myself. I had found out something that my ex had done to me that I didn't know. He had a secret. And I was really upset about it. And I went to him and I went, wah, 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 wah. And he's like, poor me, poor me, poor me. And he, he just downloaded on me like you would not believe. He kicked me in the ass so hard. And he said, Kelly, if you want to be that kind of woman, then fine, tell me. Because he said, that's not the Kelly Falardo I know. He said, the Kelly Falardo I know, she stands up for herself, and she just gets over the stupid shit and doesn't buy into that drama. So which Kelly Falardo do you want to be? You want to be this, you know, this Kelly Falardo that can't get off the couch? Or do you want to be the Kelly Falardo that's a speaker that empowers and motivates and inspires people all over the world? You tell me, because I want to know. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know? And he says, I'm not buying into your bullshit. And, you yeah. know, and we, we talked about it even today, and I was telling another girl what he had done to me. And I tell you, it was the best ass-kicking I got, because it was like, he's right. I'm playing my own drama, and it's getting me nowhere, which is what I love about my new program that I've developed called You're More Than Enough. It's eight different modules, and it's all about dealing with that pain, facing it in the mirror, know that you're doing it, know the, ca the chaos you're doing, and then shifting it all around, and then learning how to love yourself so that you can be the powerful person that you want to be. And, you know, like, it was amazing when he gave me that ass whooping, because I thought, what? He's not going to listen to me? He's not going to be on my side? Instead, he's just going to kick my ass and send me out there, and, you know, and, <laughs> and, you are the best thing. and you're probably a better woman for it. Well, I was, because someone needed to kick me off there. Someone needed to kick me off that, you know, pity party. So sometimes you need those friends that can do that with. You know, and my other friend, Kelly Fraser, you know Kelly Fraser. Oh, I love Kelly Fraser. I know, she's amazing. And it was funny because I told Kelly what Doug had done to me. And she's like, go Doug! She said, thanks Doug for me because I'm so excited that Doug did that for you. Because now you can just smarten up and be the person that you always meant to be. Hey, it, it, it's, it's, it, I, I think you, it's, we grow because we make mistakes. You know, it's, um, it's, I, I am clearly not any type of fitness or bodybuilder, but here's what I know about muscles. I know that if you want big muscles, you can't eat your way to big muscles, you can't think your way to big muscles. You can't really, for the most part, buy big muscles, although you could probably have implants. I do live in Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> but right? no buy implants. <laughs> well, you could buy those. I know, um, but come on, really? <laughs> but here's what I know about muscles. The only way a muscle is going to get bigger 
is if you lift something very heavy and you rip it apart and the, because of the scarring, it grows over on top of each other and becomes bigger. That's what I know. So I think in business and in family that sometimes it's ripping those muscles apart, letting the scar uh, happen, and then letting the, the muscle grow on top of that scar is what really makes the sum of the people or the sum of the muscle. Oh, I just came up with that off the top of my head. I'm going into the fitness world. How can I make some residual income in the fitness world? Contact me. <laughs> hey, I want in because I know how you can sell. So <laughs> we do this together. Exactly. So Casey, we are running out of time. So, of course, I want to give you an opportunity to promote any products or services that you're involved in so that, you know, we can help you out somewhere. So, you know, go into that. You know, look, here, here's, the, here's the thing, folks. Um, I'm not a guy for everybody to talk to. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a, a, a big sympathy guy. I'm, I'm really kind of a strategist. I'm a consultant from a strategic level, from a 60,000-foot view down. Um, I, 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 you probably don't want to talk to me if you are only into having a job and you have no desire, want, need to try some form of business um, and get out of that. Um, but here's what here's what here's what I'm happy to do for you guys. If you want to just talk, let's have an hour of chat time, right? And we'll talk about your business. We'll talk about uh, what can what you can do to improve, what you can do to market it better, what kind of tech. I focus on four areas, and that's technology, strategy, behavior or mindset, and the network, who you're talking to. And so, if you want to have a conversation about that or your business. Just go to connectwithkc.com. It's going to ask you where we met. You just put a little thing there that says on Kelly's show, and then there's going to be a big button there that says book it. You click that book it button, and it's going to take you right to my calendar. You pick a time that works for you, and, uh, and we'll have a conversation. There's no big stress. There's no big pressure. There's no big sale. I'm not going to ask for a credit card. Well, maybe. Um, maybe. <laughs> You know, and you know, it, I I I love sending my message and giving my message to the masses. So if you have a team, an organization, if you're in network marketing or direct sales, or you're in a sales organization, or you're in a corporate environment, and you kind of like the style uh, that I have, go to connect with Casey. Let's chat about how I can bring that message uh, to your organization. Happy happy to have that conversation. You can Google me. You can YouTube me. Uh, and you'll see all kinds of presentations. You'll kind of see what I'm about. If you are looking for a boring uh, lectern speaker with a PowerPoint, uh, I'm not your guy. I'm just not I your guy. I can't do PowerPoint anymore. <laughs> I used to do PowerPoint, and I thought, you know what? I believe that when people use PowerPoint, they rely on it too much, and it they rely on PowerPoint to tell the story. Yeah, you can go ahead and keep using that as an excuse for yourself, Kelly, um, <laughs> but it's good for you to tell everybody else what they're thinking when it's really about you, so we won't talk about that one. Um, That's for another day. <laughs> no, but I say that. I mean, I know we're going to wrap up here, but the, but the reality is, is I used to stand on stage and say I'm low tech, big check, and I really used that as oh, everybody's talking about technology, and so deep down I knew that I was afraid of technology, so I made this whole shell around me about going, oh, I'm low tech, big check. So I'm only flippantly joking about your PowerPoint thing. Um, it works for some people. It doesn't work for some people. I use PowerPoint. I don't know how to make a PowerPoint um, PowerPoint slide, which is why I never used them. So I hired a friend of mine to make me PowerPoint slides. <laughs> so, um, but you guys, look. Here's the deal. Let me let me be serious for just a second. Kelly has done several of these episodes of these shows. You want to go back and you want to watch. You want to observe. You want to get to know Kelly. Kelly is one of the most amazing women. Um, and has had has had to overcome a whole crap ton of of stuff that goes on ha, that has gone on her in her past. And where you are today, Kelly, is such an inspiration, and it's so uplifting. And I know this project is coming to a close in its in its infancy. And what you've been able to do is remarkable. And from watching the first episode to today. Is uh, it just warms me because it's 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 unbelievable the transformation that you have brought and that you've brought to your guests and your ability to connect with 
and bring out things that your guests and the people in your life probably aren't used to talking about or don't really want to talk about is nothing short of amazing. So I hope that you guys will check out conversationswithkelly.net, get connected to Kelly, talk with her, see if her program, uh, uh, her, her program is right for you, and take the step and, and get around people that can help you get from one place to the next. So Kelly, I just want to say thank you. I have been, and it's been an absolute honor. Um, when you asked me to appear on the show, I was just, I was tickled pink, and I just um, thank you for doing what you do. Oh, well, thank you. You're like bringing me to tears over that because I wasn't expecting you to do the, you know, to do that. And, you know, I was so honored when you, because you were the one who approached me and said, how can I get involved? i got to be involved in that, you know. So I was like, oh, my gosh, Casey Eberhardt wants to be a part of my show. Like, how awesome is that? So I was quite excited when you jumped on board with it, too. And, and I totally appreciate, you know, what you've done for me. So... I just want to talk a little bit more about my program because, um, you know, it, this last probably six months, I've been going through my own transformation. And just to be really brutally honest with you, I'm going through a divorce. I am going through some challenges with my daughter. I am going through um, transformation as far as my vision and my business goes. I had a car accident. I've had a one of my closest friends committed suicide and she was a one-armed woman who was able to hang herself and I was going through tremendous turmoil, tremendous. And it took hiring a coach to, to help bring me out of all of that and to figure out what my vision was. And I had absolutely no desire to do business. In fact, I couldn't even get off the couch and for a while. And it took everything in me to just even make the phone call to get her to help me because I knew I needed something and she gave me an amazing gift and this gift was she helped me to figure out that I had more gifts inside of me more golden nuggets that were willing to come out and share with you that I didn't even know existed I honestly didn't I thought my message was just to share with women that doesn't matter what you look like you can be beautiful that's what I thought my message was and she said, no, Kelly, you are going through all this stuff for a reason. And that reason is so that you can launch and develop your new program, which is called You're More Than Enough. She helped me face some demons. She helped me face some chaos. She helped me face some destruction that I was doing. I didn't even know I was doing some of this stuff. But she helped me face all that. And out of that, we... I developed a program, it's an eight week program, it's called You're More Than Enough and it's eight different modules and it's all about looking in that mirror and it's about facing that pain and what that chaos you're doing. You're not just a fat old ugly woman, you've got some pain deeper, some deeper pain, some deeper destruction that you're doing. Just like Casey and I talked about, there's a lot of destruction that we have and we just don't know how to get out of it. So I want to help you stop that head drama, I want to help you shift and I want you to learn how to love yourself. Because believe me, when you start loving yourself, it's amazing out there. And it's amazing when you can manifest everything that you want in your life. For example, I mean, I just found out, I said, I want to do a kids camp with 25 kids, and we're going to go to Costa Rica, and we are going to stay in tree houses. Not even two days later, I got a phone call from a friend of mine in Africa, and he said, Kelly, I have 25 kids that want to come to the camp in, camp in Costa Rica and they're willing to pay for it. I didn't have to do anything else. I didn't have to do any additional fundraising, nothing. It all came because I put that intention out there that that's what I wanted. Well, here's my new challenge. My sons, who are 10 years old, have challenged me and said, Mom, why don't we get a private plane to take us all down to this Costa Rica? And I was like, you think I can do it? So anyway, that was my challenge for tonight. I'm going to see if I can somehow manifest a private plane to take all these kids down to Costa Rica. So here's the thing. The program, you're more than enough, and it's $9.97, but there's a special discount for people who are watchers of the show, and it's only $4.97. And if you are having trouble affording it, that's no problem because I do have some sponsorships available. There's been some guests on my show who have offered to help people out. So send me an email, go to my website, conversationswithkelly.net, and you'll be able to get in touch with me and, and tell me why we should pick you. Because I would love to help you shift from being destructive 
into Powerful. And just like Casey was talking about, I know Casey doesn't want to see you struggle and spin your wheels, and just like he's willing to offer you to have a, an hour conversation with him, you know how much value that is? I know the first time I talked to Casey, it was amazing. He helped me to shift some things around that helped me to be way more productive and make more money and have more thoughts and more, um, more. I don't know, I can't even say the word. You just helped me to do so much stuff with it and that was amazing for me. So you need to take Casey up on his offer because you will be amazed at the ideas that will come out of his mouth that are going to help inspire you. So. I know we're getting past time, but I just believe we've had some so much valuable information. So, Casey, I was okay going over time, and I hope I haven't messed up your plans for the night. No, I know you absolutely. Got I want to be. I wanted to be right here, right now. I wouldn't want to be any other place. That's so oh, awesome. So, thank you everybody for watching the show, and um, Casey, thank you because I know it's a Friday night, and you know that's a big a big thing to give up as a Friday night when you could be out with your you know your friends or family. So thank you and good night, everybody, and we'll see you next time.